I know of nothing that's easier to get men to attend than a men's conference. And you know that each year when we gather, thousands will be there with us. Whether many choose to simulcast this in their own church or join us on the Woodstock campus, you just put aside a date, February 2nd, 3rd, and you plan to be with us on that Friday evening and Saturday morning. Or go to my website, johnnyhuntmensconference.com and go ahead and register today or find out more information about our exciting weekend. I can hardly wait to welcome you this year. Well, good morning. That is a, an ad, obviously, for the Johnny Hunt Men's Conference, which I believe you guys, you men who decide to go, will be blessed. And uh, I know we always are. We're up to 14 men right now from Smith Street Baptist Church who have said that they're interested in going. Uh, I do need you to confirm it today. You don't have to pay today. Uh, you don't have to pay. Technically, you really don't have to pay until uh, the end of, the, of, of January, 1st of February. I guess even technically -er than that, you don't have to pay until after you go, but... Uh, we'll work with you to make sure that we get reimbursed for that. That's not a problem. We're just doing it early because uh, with 10 or more, we get $45 per ticket instead of 50 So we do get a discount, and we do have 10 or more. And um, in group discounts, we, we get a discount too. So that's how the tickets are cheap, cheaper. In fact, uh, they may be more than 45 I have to check now that uh, we apply the 10 or more discount. Uh, or maybe that is the $5 off. And then the early bird rate, that's what I'm thinking of. We're in the early bird rate right now, the very early bird rate. So $45 a ticket. Uh, plus your uh, hotel room, you can split, uh, and gas costs like that. But if you have any questions about that, see me. And please see me today, uh, because we're going to place an order for those tickets no later than Tuesday morning. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take advantage of it on the day of the deadline. You don't have to be a member of the church to go. You can bring somebody from outside of the church. In fact, that would be great if you wanted to do that. Uh, if you are under 18, you may go if you are uh, uh, under 18, but you need to have your parents' uh, permission and a guardian needs to be with you to be responsible for you while you are there and you will room with them. So uh, if you have any questions about that and your ticket does not cost any less, it's the same amount. Uh, there will be some issues that are discussed there that may be sensitive to younger audience. So if you have any questions, just check with me and I'll let you know about that. I see some fanning going on. Anyone opposed to a little air on this early cold morning? Just a little air? Anyone opposed? No? All right. We'll see. Connie, you got your blanket ready? All right. We'll, we'll, not, we'll just get a little air to kind of circulate this in here. Uh, probably could just open the door and it would cool off just as quickly. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll try to make it. We'll open up with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. As we continue looking at the book of Revelation and continue in chapter 2. And we are looking at the seven churches of Asia. We'll begin in today's message with Thyra Tyra. I call this message Compromising Christians. I think you'll see why as we go through today. Stand with me, if you will, so that we may read this verse together, this section of Scripture. And standing, of course, is honor of reading God's Word. So if you are physically able to stand, please do so as we honor the Lord through the reading of His Word. Not honoring me, we're honoring God. Amen. Amen. The message to Thyatira, verse 18 of chapter 2. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness." And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my uh, sorry, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deed until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And the vessels of the potter are broken into pieces, as I have also received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning. 
when it comes to false doctrine, that you will speak truth to us, not just about what we hear and read and study, but about the way to respond to it. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, our new song. Well, today in the church, we're going to discuss Revelation, the church of Thyatira. And in the church of Thyatira this morning, what we see here uh, are in your notes. We've been given, you've been given the uh, bulletin. And in your bulletin, you are given this blanks to fill out. And you may fill those out as you see fit. And in the bulletin, the first thing that we're going to discuss is the greeting. Now, I've mentioned this every week, and it may seem old, but I'm going to, again, do it every time. So I just want you to be prepared for that. In the greeting in the first slide, uh, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira. The angel means what? Messenger, right? So we simply know this to be the messenger of the church of Thyatira. Now, what does he say? Well, well, or who says it? Well, in verse 218, the second part of that, the description of Christ is based on Revelation 1. I'm going kind of quick through this, because if you have gone through this with us, or if you've listened to the archive... You uh, know this already, but if you haven't, I'll go quick enough, but not so quick to lose you. The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and His feet are like burnished bronze says this. Again, this comes out of Revelation 1. Remember the description of Pergamum was the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. The scripture uh, description out of Smyrna was the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. And the description out of Ephesus was him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So those are the different verses here in chapter uh, in Revelation dealing with the different churches. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, we get into the commendation. He says, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. In other words, your evidence of your salvation and the evidence of your faith has been better than what it once was. It's a positive thing. It's a good thing. He's encouraging the church here at Thyatira. He's saying what you've been doing is is good. What you've been doing is better even than what you did before. But then there's that verse that we talked about last week, that verse that says in verse 20, but I have this against you, the verse that we don't want to hear. So let's read that and then let's talk about this in the condemnation part. And I know you say, well, man, we went through the first three parts very quickly. That's because I plan on spending a lot of time here at this part, number four, in the condemnation part, talking about the church that I retire. In verse 2, chapter verse, uh, Revelation 2.20 says this, But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The woman at Thyatira was called Jezebel because, just like the Old Testament figure Jezebel, she seduced people into sexual immorality and idolatry. Those were two major forms of paganism in the Asia Minor area at that time, idolatry and sexual immorality. Now, that may or may not be much different than what's taking place in the world today idolatry and sexual immorality, two major issues that we have. And by the way, just for the record, sexual immorality, just so you're clear on this, it's not one specific issue dealing with homosexuality. It's dealing with all kinds of immoral sexual acts. So there anything you can imagine that is immoral or against God in that realm would fall into this, including but not limited to premarital sex. So we have to keep in mind that as we look at this, this is not just one thing that we are or aren't comfortable with or one thing we do or don't deal with. This is something that God has laid out in his word through Jesus to the messenger to the church here that we will then apply to us to be an issue of all immorality, all sexual immorality. Now, with that being said, let me be clear about something. If you're guilty of sexual immorality, Jesus died on the cross that you might repent of that. All right, so grace covers it. So let's not sit here and be sad or afraid or something that may have happened 20 years ago because God sent his son to die for the forgiveness of your sins and mine alike. With that being said, the problem here is that the sin of these seducers, these Jezebelian followers, was that they attempted to draw the people of God into this lifestyle, into an acceptance of this lifestyle of idolatry and sexual immorality. In fact, they would call themselves prophets or prophetesses, 
and say that they were speaking directly from God on such issues. And the people were believing it. Some of them, not all of them in the church were believing that, but some of them were believing it and they were buying into this. And the prophetesses or prophets or false ones would claim a superior authority in regard to the ministers of the church. In other words, they would say that we have a higher authority than those who've been left here to lead this church or these churches in this area. And so in this city or this location of Thyatira, which if I'm not mistaken is about 45 miles away from Pergamum where we were last week, we are now in this place uh, of, of, of um, what I would consider very similar to what we deal with in the modern day church. Let me give you an example. Anything that you pick in the modern day church, anything that you turn on the news and see that they are saying, whoever they is or whoever they are, maybe the leaders of the church, leaders of denominations, uh, church members who profess Christ, whatever it may be, whoever they are, if they are saying something, now listen to this carefully because this really needs to be the litmus test we measure ourselves against. If they are saying that something is right and that right something falls against or goes against or does not correspond with the Word of God, it is not the Word of God that is wrong. It is those who are professing that that way of life or that belief. Now, there are people who are going to say, and and listen, there are Christians who say this. Well, now, God's Word, I mean, that Bible, that's that's old, and that's archaic, and that is, uh, you know, it was applying to that time. Well, you know what, you're right. It is old, and it was applying to that time. But there's a modern day application today that comes out of this thought. And it is that God's ways don't ever, never, never will ever, ever have or going to change. So if God's ways will never change, then there are applications that we can apply. Let's be honest about the Bible for a minute. I hear this a lot in apologetics conversations where people want to argue against the authority of the word. I hear a lot of, of, of this kind of argument. Well, this was a time where women didn't have rights. True. This was a time where men were, uh, were, were the head of everything. True. But there are cases where women were the head of the church. There are cases where women were out doing the ministry of deaconesses. That'll blow your mind. But there were situations where they were out doing that stuff. Am I arguing for modern day deaconesses? No, I'm not. But there were situations where God used women in the absence of men to get things done. He used them in judges. And so what we see here is... A true statement when we say that that time was all about masculinity. But that doesn't mean that God's word was written to somehow give man some ungodly authority or superiority over everyone else. Because that would contradict God's character, wouldn't it? You see, if God died, if Jesus died on the cross for the sins of man and woman alike, and Paul said that there was... Neither, no difference between either Jew or Gentile, then what Scripture is telling us is that God's love and His mercy and His grace through Christ on the cross is for every person, regardless of gender, regardless of white or black or Latino or whatever. He doesn't care. He made them all, He died for them all, and all those who will give their life to Him will go be with Him. Now, it's important that we recognize that today. Because what we've done in this culture is we've taken, in this society, is we've taken God's word, we've put it in our holy huddle, and we've applied it, our translation or our interpretation to it. People will say sometimes, well, you know, I can have one interpretation and you can have another interpretation. And I would tell you, yes, that's true. You can have one and I can have one, but I would add that only one of us can be right. Now, some people would say, well, what makes you think you're right? Well, I don't know. What makes you think you're right? Let's sit down and discuss it. Let's look at God's word. Let's see what it says. Let's go back and study the original languages. Hey, I'm all about that. If you and I sit down and we're having a discussion and you say, you know, you preach this, but I don't think that's what God's word says. Man, I'm all about it because here's one of the things that's going to happen. Either I'm going to be wrong, which means I'm going to learn it and never preach it wrong again, I guarantee you. Or you're going to be wrong and I'm going to get to sit there and watch this light come on in your head when you go, oh, I see now. And that's awesome experience to see that light bulb come on for people. So either way, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Either way, we're good, right? Either I'm going to be proved right by the word, uh, wrong by the word of God, or you're going to be proved wrong by the word of God. But either way, if we'll accept that correction from God, we will become better Christians for it. So praise God for that, right? Who, who would have thought you'd say, praise God for when I'm wrong being corrected? Now, now here's the problem. We correct people a lot, but we don't use the word of God as a foundation. We correct people a lot, but we don't use the word of God. You know, we use, we, we use our, 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 our uh, traditions. We use our opinions. 
We use our thoughts. This is one of the most damaging statements you can say to somebody who is a critic of you when it comes to the way you're living. You can ask them simply in love and Jesus, grace, the grace of Christ, and simply say to them, would you please show me where God's word says that? That'll shut down your critics. If they're claiming you should live a certain way, ask them to show you where God's word says that. Guess what? If it ain't in God's word, it's not truth. Does that mean, now let me clarify, does that statement mean that God, everything that we have is the truth and we have 100% of the truth? Yes and no. We have everything that we have in God's word is the truth, but we don't have 100% of the truth. And here's what I mean. God has not revealed everything to us. But everything about our lives, the way we should live and what should be important in our lives, he has revealed to us. In fact, he's revealed it time in and time out through scripture. And so what we have to do today as a church in 2017, almost, believe it or not, 2018, is we have to decide whether or not we're going to live according to what God's word teaches. See, some of you have different opinions than I do about certain issues. And if they're not in God's word, we can agree to disagree. Then again, there's some things that are in God's word that we can still agree to disagree, but you're going to be wrong. (laughs) And you're not wrong with me. You're wrong against God's word. Don't compare yourself to my thoughts. I told my Sunday school class this morning, could you please, could you just please go home and read and study what I preach on today and see if you can find error. Because again, one of two things happens. Either you find error and you come and correct me and we will grow together, or you Grow from studying it because you actually picked it up and looked at it and thought about it and prayed about it again. How many Christians really come to church, God bless them, and they go home and they don't ever open their Bible again until the next week? Or if they do, they may read a little bit or maybe they open their Bible and go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to read, but I'm going to go do that later. And then they walk away from it and they don't ever, I mean, how many of them go home and actually study the sermon that was preached that morning? In fact, I'll challenge you this, challenge you. If you go to lunch today, when your waitress or waiter brings you your bill, Look at the person you're with and say, tell me what the preacher's sermon was about. And don't accept, it was about revelation. (laughs) Because that's what people do, right? Oh, he preached on revelation or something. Don't don't let them get you. Oh, he preached on fire tyra. Don't don't let that be the, what's what's it about? The answer is false doctrine. What is doctrine? A teaching. It's about false doctrine. See, the church is full of false doctrines. The churches are full of false teachers. Now, I could tell you that it would delight me also to run out and go and charge and and, and get everybody on the right page, but that's not what God's called me to do. See, coming up on Tuesday, you'll celebrate, or maybe you won't, but people will be celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in which uh, uh, Martin Luther went to the church of Wittenberg, Germany, where he was teaching in the... Uh, school there in the in the college and the seminary and he nailed the 95 theses to the front door of the church not to cause a reformation but because he wanted to have a normal debate among his peers did you know that a debate among your peers is okay Uh, some of you don't uh, some of you don't debate among your peers a debate is not an argument folks a debate is a friendly conversation where two people who have two opinions bring the facts of why they believe that certain way, and they discuss it together. Not trying to convince one person of one thing or the other, but simply stating why they believe something. Can you actually have a debate? Yes, you can. You know when it turns into an argument? When pride gets in the way. Think about it. Nobody argues about humility. You know, nobody argues about humility. People argue about pride. You will do it my way. You will agree with what I say. How dare you talk to me that way? It all comes down to pride, doesn't it? It's the humble person that says, hey, if you don't want to agree, that's cool. You don't have to agree with what I do, what I say. Now, if I was the author of the scripture, I might feel a little differently. But since I'm not the author of scripture, which the author is God, you take it up with him. But I may be wrong on my interpretation. It's possible. Others are wrong on their interpretation. So we sit down and we discuss it. And this is the question I have to ask you. If you're going to combat false doctrine, this is the question you have to be able to answer. Why do you believe what you believe? If you can't answer that question, how are you ever going to discuss the gospel with someone? One of the most infuriating questions to a person who can't answer 
The question is why? That's infuriating. You know why parents get so upset with their kids when they tell them, go clean your room? Why? Because of pride. What do you mean pride? They better list, They better do what I say. Right? Yeah? Let's see, it's funny, I got all the young folks laughing. They're like, mm-hmm. Amen, preacher. Pride. You know, here's a thought. Take time to sit down with them when you can. You can't always take time at that moment. But take time to sit down with them and explain to them why it's important for them to have a clean room. Why is it important to clean your room? Because it teaches you how to take care of your possessions and your belongings. And if you become a person who does that, you'll one day take care of your car. You'll take care of your house. You'll take care of the church you attend. You'll be the person that walks in the park. And as you're walking down the park, you see a piece of trash. And instead of walking by it, you'll bend down and pick it up and put it in the can. It wasn't your trash. And people go, well, that's not mine. I didn't put it there. Because we're used to being told to just pick up what behind ourselves. Why don't we pick up after everybody? I'll tell you something else that comes by picking up your, tra- your, your, your room or, or keep doing chores at home. It teaches you respect for authority. What about that? We don't have respect for authority in this country. Somebody gets pulled over by a cop, guess what the first thing they want to do is? They want to argue their case. That's not where you argue your case. If the cop's wrong, you argue your case in court before a judge. You don't argue your case on the side of the road. You lose on the side of the road. Because he has more authority than you do. You live in a country where the authority is given to the police to keep law and order. Guess what? That's his job. You don't have to like it. I don't like it. It's been a long time since I've been pulled over for speeding. It's been a very, very long time. He was rude to me. Guy down in Charlton County, he was rude to me. But you know what? He wasn't there to be my friend. He was there to stop me because I was breaking the law. Think about what I just said. It's one thing for your waiter or your waitress to be rude to you, right? It's another thing for, I mean, come on. You got, you just broke the law. You broke the law. He didn't break the law. You broke the law. You were speeding. You broke the law. You rolled the stop sign. People say, well, I just rolled the stop sign. Well, that'd be great if it was a roll sign. (laughs) It's a stop sign. You just argued for the other side in that statement. I rolled the stop sign. Well, I was only doing 15 over the speed limit. It's a speed limit. It's not a suggestion. It's a limit. See, we don't take responsibility for our actions. Why? Well, I believe because the church is not teaching doctrine correctly. Because we don't even have authority. I mean, we don't even have respect for Christ. Much less the police, the government. The, the, and hey, all police are not good. All government officials are not good. All pastors are not good. The only one who's always good all the time is God. All of y'all aren't good all the time. Don't pretend you are. We already know you're not. Some of y'all are looking around thinking, I am. You're the ones we're talking to. We haven't taught a, a, a respect for authority in the church. Not the respect for the authority of the pastor, but the respect for the authority of God. You know why we haven't taught that or why we're not living that? Because go back, or how I know that, because go back to the church of Thyatira. Some of them were living in sexual immorality and idolatry. That right there speaks that they were not honoring God. You have the power and the ability as a believer, if you're a Christian, as the, you have the power and the ability in you to honor God with your life, with your body, and with your choices. Some of y'all like prancing around during the summertime and barely anything, right? Hey, you know what? Sister Christian, I understand that you're going to disagree with me on that. Can I just be, my wife's not in here, can I just tell you the truth? I'm a guy. I'm a Christian man who loves Jesus, but I'm a guy. And if I walk on the beach and you're barely dressed, these eyes will notice your barely dressingness. That may, that it may embarrass you, that may make you uncomfortable, but you just better go ahead and recognize that your pastor is going to go, you're barely dressed. It's not like somebody's going to come up to me and say, did you see? See, some of the guys are trying not to laugh. They're like, man, I can't believe, oh my Lord Jesus, he's letting it all out. You know, people come up, it's not like somebody's going to come up to me and say, pastor, what did you notice about her? Hmm? And I'm going to go, well, I noticed that she had her hair done. I noticed her eyes. She's got a great personality. Right? And I, I'm, I'm kind of being tongue-in-cheek here, but in all seriousness, 
If you go out wearing hardly anything, they will notice. Men will notice. Now, here's the difference between me and some men, and I'm not bragging because it's the power of God, and my wife does know this, and we talk about it all the time. If I see a woman who's barely dressed out on the beach, it is my duty as a Christian man to avert my eyes. It is my duty as a Christian man who loves God and loves my wife to take my eyes off of that woman and put them on something holy. Notice I said off of that woman and on something holy. Because that woman's dress is not holy. I know that stings. I'm not judging you. I'm not jealous because you look better in a bikini than I do. (laughs) Although you probably do. I'm telling you that men out there, boys out there, and men out there, and and I don't care care how old these men are. (laughs) You think these 70, 80 year old men aren't still men? I got news for you. They are men. I'm going to let you in on a secret. They quit being men when they die. (laughs) So we got to respect our bodies, respect our life, respect this thing that God gave us out here by respecting God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not casting judgment on that situation because I understand that this time is different time. But I also understand that, quite honestly, God hasn't changed. If you had... As many conversations with men as I do on a regular basis about the struggle with porn or the struggle with the addiction or the struggle with sexual issues, then you would know what I'm telling you is the truth. And if you want to find out, go three hours north to where the biggest sex trade in the world, in the country is going on right now. Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Where the number one place, in the last statistics I had anyway, which has been a few years ago, But as of that point, the number one place for sex trafficking. Think about it. Let that soak in for a minute. Let's let's, let's spend just a minute thinking, if we will. I hope you're uncomfortable. That's what this was all about. Think about this for a minute. Some girl, 15 years old, kidnapped in the night. She's taken away. She's placed in a cargo container somewhere. And she's scared. She's crying. She misses her mom and her dad and her friends. And her biggest problem was whether or not she was going to be able to go to the prom with that boy she liked. And instead now, she's stuck in the dark with a bunch of other women, young women, girls who are crying out, who are scared. And she feels this container moving. And she feels this 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 traveling going on but she can't see because it's dark she hears men talking some of them in languages she doesn't understand and she's been in this forever and every now and then the door will open up and they'll throw some food in some bread or something but she's she's not able to go out she's not able to to do what she needs to do to be a young lady who was just before this experience free to come and go as she pleased to get on her phone to snapchat and all that stuff When the doors finally do open, she's in a location that she's never seen before, around men that she's never trusted before. She's grabbed like a piece of meat or a yard animal and snatched off the out of the the trailer or out of the box. And she goes to the highest bidder or the guy who paid the money to have his way with her. She's threatened, she's slapped, she's beaten. She's drugged. So that she can't fight back. She's bound. She's tied. She's raped. Over and over and over. Her innocence is taken away. Her chance at a future dwindles. Her hope to have children may be destroyed. Back at home, her radio is still on that station that was on the night before. Her bedroom, the bed still made as she left it. Her homework still sitting on the desk. And the books that she had brought home still in her bag. Her cell phone's been discarded, although it's received hundreds of calls of people trying to find her, text after text. The boy that she was going to hope would ask her to the prom sits back at home worried and wondering Where has she gone? Nobody knows. She's just disappeared in the night. 
This girl may never make it home. Now you tell me. You t- I mean, I'm sorry. We're uncomfortable because we're in church talking about what? what we're uncomfortable because we have to stretch out of our personal little happy place that the church is known for and get into the real world. Folks, we're not talking about some other country. This is right up north of us. And I'll tell you another secret that may shock you. Sometimes those girls never leave the state of Georgia. Guys will fly into Atlanta for these Super Bowl games or big games. And they'll pay for these kids. And they'll go to hotels that you stay in when you go to Atlanta. And this stuff will happen. This stuff's happening in your state. It's happening in your country. And girls are taken right off the streets in small town USA. We're not talking Chicago. We're not talking Detroit. We're not talking L.A. We're talking Atlanta. We're talking where you would probably not think twice to run for a weekend trip. Or maybe even just for the day. And we're not talking about strangers. We're talking about your sisters, your daughters, your granddaughters, your friends. There's some sick people out there who will do some sick things. And so forgive me for being, and if you don't want to come back to this church after this, I don't blame you. And if you want to vote me out and send me packing, I don't blame you. Because this is for real, serious. But forgive me. Forgive me for a moment. Not out of arrogance, out of humility. Forgive me if what I've said has hurt or offended you in any way. But I must take that risk. Because it's happening because we're not dealing with the real issue. We have compromised with the spirit of Jezebel. We put pictures on Facebook and Instagram. I mean, if you wouldn't stand up here in the church with, uh, in front of the pulpit, in front of God and everybody in the outfit you put on Instagram or Facebook, you probably ought not put it on the internet because there's a whole lot, whether you know, statistics may not bear this out, but there's probably a whole lot more pedophiles and sick folks out there looking at those pictures on Instagram and Facebook than sitting in the church this morning. I don't mean to sound arrogant when I say this, but they're not all godly men and they're not all averting their eyes. I may be an old-fashioned fart. (laughs) That probably was what offended everybody. But I'll tell you like this. I got a five, almost six-year-old daughter who I don't want going in a bikini because I know there are men out there who will look at my five-year-old's midriff And get turned on by it. And if that's uncomfortable for you, tough. Because that's sin. That's sin. And how do we combat this? By not putting ourselves in these positions, folks. I I say that with total humility. I love you. And that's God. And, And I'll tell you something else. You'd be mad if you want, but that's God's word. And I'm going to wrap it up with this idea here and we'll try to end it on a happy note. And I didn't mean to get off on all that, but I'm going to say this right now. Matthew Henry's commentary on this verse says this. Why should the wickedness of this Jezebel be charged upon the church of Thyatira? Listen to me again. Why should the wickedness of this church, of this Jezebel be charged? Listen to me now. Listen to me. Why should the, why should the wickedness of this Jezebel, be charged upon the church of Thyatira. It's the same question you may be having, which is this. Why should this wickedness of what's going on out there be something I bring up and put on you today? And here's the answer. Because the church suffered her, allowed her to seduce the people of that city. In other words, when we allow this stuff to happen, when we allow ourselves to put ourselves in positions to entice the enemy and the evils of this world, we become responsible. We cannot do what the church has been doing for countless ages, and that is turning a blind eye and hoping it goes away. Whether it's this or abortion or whatever, poverty or whatever the issue, 
We cannot turn a blind eye to social injustices as they take place in this country on all levels and expect it to get any better. The saying goes that bad happens because or evil is allowed to triumph because good men say nothing. If you have your bulletin, I put in your bulletin a quote. I thought I had mine, but I had in your bulletin a quote up there. Somebody have a bulletin I can have. The, the quote says this at the bottom of your notes page. I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. You know why pastors are afraid to preach this message? Because they do. They get fired over this message. Pastors will be removed from churches over this message. Because pastors have people in the pews that don't want to hear the truth. The gospel will offend us. Not living like God has told us to. And knowing it, having it called out, it will offend us, it will hurt our feelings, it will embarrass us, and it's only because of God's love and motivation of love for us that He put it in there. He wants better for us. He doesn't want... Don't put yourself in a position to end up in a bad spot and then cry out and blame God for it when God's warning of exhortation is right here and it's clear. Don't compromise with the world. Love them, pray for them, take Jesus to them, but quit compromising with them. Quit compromising with them. Y'all, what do we have to do? What more do I have to say? Jesus laid it out in the last book. Right here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. You tolerate the woman of Jezebel, he said. The church is tolerating a spirit of Jezebel. Now I'm not telling you to combat false doctrine. You need to run out there and beat people over the head. Because that's not what I'm going to do. If I go to the beach and you're in a bikini, I'm not going to come up and call you out. I'm not going to come up to you and call you down. If you put it on Facebook, I'm not going to send you a message and try to hurt your feelings. That's not, the, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. But I'm telling you that whatever it is that you're compromising with, the warning is here. And this goes for me too. We all compromise and we need to quit. The warning is here that if we compromise with this stuff, it will ruin our testimony and it will destroy the mission we're working towards. If you don't believe me, look around and answer this question before you go. Answer this question. You may be madder than a wet hen. Answer this question. Why do you think that 4% of the millennial generation is either unchurched or lost? I mean, I'm sorry. Why do you think that 96% of the millennial generation is either unchurched or lost? 4% claim to know Jesus. 4%, 4 claim to go... If, you're, if you were born between 1980 and 2000, raise your hand. High so the world can see it. Guys, that's our generation. Stand up. If you were raised between 1980 and 2000, if you were born, stand up for me. Now watch what happens. The rest of you get ready. You're going to play too. Watch this. If, you're, if you are one of these, everybody, now I want all my millennials, and I'm in that too. I don't really like it, but I'm there. I want you guys to look around. All of the rest of you, stand up. Watch what happens. Everybody else, stand up. Look at all these other people standing up. Oh, wait a minute. Sit back down. <laughs> Sit back down. i got to do that again. Sit back down. Millennials, if you were born from 1980 until now, stand up. Was anybody... When were y'all born? Sterling? Stand up! <laughs> stand up, CJ. Stand up. Tommy, yeah, yeah. I, I, stand up, uh, uh, Jacob. Y'all are messing up my stuff now. <laughs> I know I cut it off in 2000. That was my fault. Now the rest of y'all. Look. Look at this. Guys, in all seriousness, our generation, we represent 4% of it. 4% who are unapologetically going to 
proclaim Jesus at some point. You may sit. Thank you for letting me embarrass you. I hope you'll be back. Now the rest of you, 96% of the generation that just stood up is going to hell. And listen to me, because you're going to think I'm making this up. That's not statewide, and that's not nationwide. That's Daniel Baptist Association-wide. That's 45-mile radius from Ailey, Georgia, where the association is located. Those statistics come from our association. That ought to make you think that 96% of our generation, millennials, is going to hell. If Jesus came back right now, how many of your friends would burn forever in eternity? You know why this is? It's because the rest of the generations have been getting slacker and slacker as time has gotten here. Our parents have gotten slack. Their parents weren't as slack, but they were slack. The generations have gotten easier about going to church, reading your Bible, praising God, putting Him first, and it's become, let's not offend, let's tolerate this. You've tolerated the woman Jezebel, he said. So here's my challenge that comes from Scripture as we wrap up today. Because I know you feel just as good as you possibly can. Y'all are like, well, I don't know. I was, I was feeling great when I got there this morning. <laughs> Here's the end point. And I, I'll give you the last couple notes here real quick, just so you can have them in your bulletin. Warning is the next one. Exhortation is the next one. And promise is the next one. And here's what I want to give you, the promise here. Verse 25. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I'll give authority of the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and his vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Is this what this means? And I don't want you to... Listen. I'm going to take our streamers with me here. I don't want you to think... That my point today is that if you've ever done anything wrong, you're pathetic and you're worthless and you ought to just die and go to hell. Okay, because that's not my point. Because we're all, that's not the point I'm trying to make. Because we're all pathetic, we're all worthless, we're all in need of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus for forgiveness and the remission of sins. We all need it, every one of us. And what I might do is not any worse or any better in the eyes of God than what you do. So let's understand that right away, that we're all in the same playing field of needing the blood of Jesus because there's only one who's worthy of the glory. This is simply a warning that he gives us. And that warning is that there's false doctrine going on all over the place. In the churches and out of the churches just like it was then. And we can either accept this false doctrine which will lead us astray and cause some to die and go to hell who didn't believe. Like the universalism doctrine which is that God loves everybody so why would he send anybody to hell? If God loved everybody, everybody should go to heaven. So we don't really have to believe in Jesus. I might, I might not. But as long as I know that God out there, whatever, he might be a three-headed God. He might be the universe. Whatever it is, it's a loving being. And it loves me so much that it's not going to send me to hell. That doctrine will cause people to go to hell. That doctrine will cause people to go to hell. And so... Whether you liked it or not, whether it got on your toes, moved up to your knees, and sat on your shoulders, the truth of the matter is, we've got to stop accepting certain things in this country and in the church. We've got to start teaching our kids to obey authority, respect authority, do the right thing. If they're not respecting you in the home, how are they going to respect the police out there when they get pulled over for speeding? Or worse, the judge who tells him, sit down and be quiet while he's talking, they stand up and yell at him and he throws him in jail for an extended sentence. I mean, we got to do the right thing at home. We got to do the right thing in the church. 
And the right thing is to take the example that Christ has given us through the church of Thyatira and not be that church and not compromise. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean if you make a mistake and you mess up, you should be thrown into hell? No. Grace says that we can keep moving forward, be forgiven, change our behaviors. So I don't want to hear that. I don't want you to hear me condemning anybody as parents or anybody as teenagers or anybody as people. I don't want to hear that. I don't want you to hear that. Because I'm just a mess up as anybody. But we have got to live better in, in, in concert with the Word of God and its teachings in our life. If we don't live better, if we don't work towards living a holy life, if we don't work towards following God's Word on a daily basis, we will never improve and we will never see blessings in abundance. And everybody likes blessings in abundance. But more importantly than that, it ought to be our love for Jesus Christ that motivates us to be those kind of people. And sometimes we have to scream out like Sarah, who was scared to death to come out and sing that song. But sometimes we just have to say, give me faith to trust what you say. Give me faith to trust what you say. God, I don't get this. But I'm, I'm going to ask you to give me faith to trust it. Now, if you have any questions about this message, would you go over there, please? <laughs> I had her unlock it before the service began. Um, so we're ready to go, right? If you have any questions about this sermon, you know who you need to go talk to? Me. If you're not sure about what I said or what I meant or how I said it, come ask. If you disagree, come talk. Let's talk. Because I'm not telling you what I believe you need to do. I'm telling you what God's Word says we need to do. And I'm right there with you. And you're going to have to help me. And I'm going to have to help you. And you're going to have to help each other. Is that understood? We're all in this thing together. That's true. I heard a one-liner when I was a youth pastor. What we don't correct, we confirm. What we don't correct, we confirm. That's true. We've got to do it in love. We've got to pray about it before we do it. But we need to stand up for Jesus because He's worth standing up for. Amen? Well, then stand up. <laughs> During this time of invitation, as always, we invite you to come forward.